Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast, Branches of Wisdom. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and I'm very excited that we're joined today by Marianne Williamson. She's a best-selling author, political activist, and spiritual thought leader. For over three decades, Mary Ann has been a leader in spiritual and religiously progressive circles. She is the author of 14 books, four of which have been number one New York Times bestsellers, including her mega bestseller, A Return to Love. Williamson founded Project Angel Food, a nonprofit that has delivered more than 14 million meals to ill and dying homebound patients since 1989. The group was created to help people suffering from the ravages of HIV and AIDS. She has also worked throughout her career on poverty, anti-hunger and racial reconciliation issues. In 2004, she co-founded the Peace Alliance and supports the creation of a US Department of Peace. She ran for the Democratic nomination for president in 2020. And in 2021, she launched MarianneWilliamson.substack.com. If you'd like to learn more about today's distinguished guest, please visit her website at Marianne.com. So Banyan community, please join me in a warm welcome for Marianne Williamson. It's really a delight to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Mariana, I wanted to start with a, a quote from your website that leads me into a question. Um, it was something I really wanted to ask you about. So the quote is this, and it's from uh, your book, A Politics of Love, a handbook for a new American revolution. You said, it was love that abolished slavery. It was love that gave women suffrage. It was love that established civil rights. And it is love that we need now. So you're referring to, to love and its role in American history. And, you know, I'm always inspired looking at American history and some of these powerhouse female uh, role models and leaders that really helped to shift things politically and socially. And they all had a deep, deep spiritual life. I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about who some of your inspirational figures have been from American history that give you fuel in these times. Well, in terms of the larger political story, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt, more than anyone else, along with Thomas Jefferson, in terms of women who have made a difference, and you're talking about the deep spiritual core, I'm fascinated by the women suffragettes, um, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, and more. Many of the women who were leaders in the women's suffragette movement were Quakers. Um, the, the larger story of social justice movements in the United States has been very rooted in religious and spiritual centers. Um, the abolitionist movement came out of the early evangelicals in New Hampshire. Many of the women who headed the uh, women's suffragette movement were Quakers. And of course, the civil rights movement was led by a Baptist preacher named Martin Luther King Jr. Um, 
Quakerism is particularly significant. I don't know if Quakers uh, have played a role uh, in the life of Canada as uh, they have uh, in the United States, a very unsung role in many ways. But the core principle uh, of the Quaker is the idea of an inner light within every man, woman, and child. And through that inner light, we are equal. Therefore, for the Quaker in their dedication to that uh, universality of light, it becomes intolerable uh, for whites to win at the expense of blacks, for men to win at the expense of women, for adults to win at the expense of children, uh, et cetera. So not just in terms of women, but in terms of the entire narrative of social justice, I have noticed the deep soulfulness of the um, uh, of the drive for social justice, and that includes, you know, the, the one I've been reading about most recently is Franklin Roosevelt. I've been in a real Franklin Roosevelt kick. Uh, I'm reading Francis Perkins' book about him uh, now. I read Doris Kearns Goodwin' uh, book, No Ordinary Time. What I'm fascinated by with uh, Franklin Roosevelt is the role that polio played in his political and spiritual transformation. And um, he was tall, he was athletic, he was handsome, he was rich, he was a Roosevelt. All of those things, which, and within that he was known for rather smug attitude, because um, he had it all. You know, he was an American aristocrat to whatever extent we have them. And he was so felled, uh, literally also, but also psychologically, emotionally, uh, by the experience of polo, polio. And in every book that I've read about him, it talks about how his smugness was washed away. Um, I, I read an amazing quote yesterday in the Francis Perkins book, it was so amazing. Um, it was saying that to Franklin Roosevelt, when he got polio and then he lived in, his, in, in the wheelchair and came over the years to understand he would not be getting out of that wheelchair. Um, it said something along the line of no matter who you were, no matter how boring you were, no matter how whatever, he saw you as superior to him for no other reason than that you could walk around the room and exercise. Um, he had an entirely different heart. Um, and I think it's interesting because when we think of what he did in the history of my country, um, it really brings up how the role of suffering um, in his own life, expanded his heart and made him the man we needed him to be for the times in which he lived. Wow, wow. Now, I think uh, um, the Banyan books has a lot of, uh, our, our community has a lot of people that are familiar with your, your work and your books. <clears throat> Um, we'd have some that would know you as a spiritual teacher, some that would be aware that you've entered into the political arena and, and the arena of social activism, and some that, that wouldn't. I'm wondering if for our audience, you can, you can uh, help them understand a little bit that progression for you from author and spiritual leader uh, into that arena. There's a story someone once told me that a Protestant theologian had come up with. And I think of it as the progression from the Good Samaritan to the Conscious Samaritan. So the story of the Good Samaritan in the Bible is that the Good Samaritan is walking down the road and sees um, a, a beggar. And the Good Samaritan gives the beggar alms. And then the Good Samaritan walks down the road some more and sees another beggar and gives that beggar alms. And then the Good Samaritan walks down the road some more and sees a beggar and gives the beggar alms. Walks down the road, sees another beggar. And at a certain point, the Good Samaritan says to himself, why are there so many beggars? That speaks to my own um, journey. Now, I grew up in a generation where we read Alan Watts and Ram Dass in the morning and went to Vietnam anti-war protests in the afternoon. So I came from a place growing up where there wasn't this, what I see as an artificial division between your spiritual commitment and your political commitment, because both should be let us will love one another. But in terms of my professional um, journey, it came to a place where I saw so many good people working hard, doing all the things that are supposedly the right things to do, living in the richest country in the world, not able to make it. You know what that's called? That's called bad public policy. 
and, and no amount of private charity can compensate for a basic lack of social justice. And that's why, you know, I would hear politicians say things to me like, what should we do for all these people living through a mental health crisis? My response was stop driving them crazy. Stop making it so hard for them to live on one, on one paycheck from one job. Stop making it so hard uh, for them to get basic rights of dignity at work. Try m making it not so hard for them to buy a house, not so hard for them to make, make a vacation, not so hard for them to send their kids to college. This is you guys who did this. And I got tired of saying it. And I saw that the entire system works in such a way that that situation would not change unless and until somebody came along, as I think many people have come along, not just myself, outside that system to call it on its own malfeasance. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Now, I, I saw an interview with you on uh, Breakfast Club on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And one, yeah, th that was great. And, and one of the things that you said about your experience uh, in politics was that it was one half brutality one half exhilaration and you said it's really not something that you take lightly can you fill us in a little bit on what that experience was like for you well i've said it before that i learned the system is even more corrupt than i feared and people are even more wonderful than i hoped mm -hmm. i came out of the uh experience deeply aware of how the political economic and media systems conspire to make sure that their predetermined agenda and their predetermined group of people who they see as capable of and um, acquiescent enough to that agenda to push, push it forward and how vicious they can be to people who do not toe that line. I saw that, but I also saw the nobility and the dignity and the decency and the intelligence of people all over this country. And it made, I came out of the experience somewhat uh, tattered <laughs> emotionally and psychologically, but I had to take my time for personal healing of all that, to forgive myself, to forgive others. But I was left with a stronger, not a weakened faith in what representative democracy can do. The problem is not with representative democracy. The problem is that in my country today, our democracy does not represent the voice of the people. The voice of the people is drowned out too often by the voice of corporate donors who wish to use the levers of government to serve their own short-term profit, uh, bottom line, rather than what government should serve, uh, which is the safety and the health and the well-being of the people in this country, people in the world who are affected by American foreign policy and animals and the earth itself. You know, um, one of the things that I, I often hear in conversation, and, I, and I've said it myself, and I'm wondering if it's true to your experience or if it's just an excuse, is that no matter how idealistic someone is when they go into politics, the system is set up in such a way that even if they're able to get elected, they've had to sell, sell out by the time they get there. Is that true in your experience? Or is it possible? No. I don't think it's that black and white. Yeah, uh, definitely, yeah. we are a system that is deeply corrupted by money. There is no doubt about that. But I have known people working within the system who are in there fighting for the fighting the good fight every single day. I think it's very simplistic to say everybody who's in there gets sucked in and seduced. Many do, but I think quite a few do not. But if they're not in leadership, I mean, there's so many ways to backbench politicians. So uh, I, I, I've been in Washington and known people in that system enough to know some of them are very admirable people trying their very, very best every single day. They are as smart as what's really going down as anybody else is. Yeah. They get it. So do you feel for, for where you're at now, and I know you get asked this all the time, but where you're at now, do you think you're more effective in or outside of the political arena? Well, the problem with this, uh, first of all, in terms of the healing and the repair of our civilization, American civilization and global civilization, which of course, you as a Canadian, this is not, you know, these larger questions are not just questions that apply to Americans, but apply yeah. to uh, all people in the world. Um, the, uh, the, we, we must take inside and outside approaches. However, in terms of the work that I do, when people say to me, work outside the political system, 
and help lift the consciousness, my response to that is consciousness has been lifted. That's not where the problem is. You can look at issue after issue and uh, poll after poll. The American people are left of center. They already want universal health care, which of course you guys already have. They already want free affordable college. They already want greater action on climate change. They already want all of the things which uh, I talk about. That's not where, you know, the consciousness of the people are, is not the problem. The problem are the people who are holding the levers of power. And I've spent many years trying to influence many of those people. It is time to simply replace them. And that's the part of me that uh, is leaning towards getting back in there. I said when I... Uh, when I ended my campaign for president, I, I promised my supporters that I would continue to the best of my ability to inconvenience all the people who so need to be inconvenienced. I hope I'm doing a pretty good job. <laughs> From what I can tell you are, I mean, you're, you're on fire when I see you speak and it's very, very inspiring. And I, I, I really hope that you continue with that line. Now, thank you. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Because even as a Canadian, I think anywhere in the world, a lot of the issues that you're touching on uh, they're human issues. They're human issues. Now, Marianne, you're starting a speaking tour of this country, Canada, August 21st this year, 2022. You start in our capital, Ottawa, and then you're visiting four other Canadian cities, Montreal, Toronto, Kelowna, Vancouver, where Banyan Books is. It's titled, this tour, An Evening with Marianne Williamson, Join the Evolution, and it says, it's time to pursue the power of love. Now, if I might, uh, can I share a quote from the event description and then ask you a question about it? Sure. Okay. So the opening of the event description says, we all learned about evolution when we were children. A species that continues to behave in maladaptive ways will either evolve or it will go extinct. And so will ours. Our irreverence, our foolishness, our lack of responsibility towards ourselves, our children, each other, animals and the earth itself are not just wrong, they are unsustainable. It's time to stage an intervention on ourselves to disrupt the pattern of insane perception that has led us to where we are today. We must recognize fear as a false intelligence and embrace the wisdom of the heart. Now, I've studied Course in Miracles a little bit, but I know not everybody has. Can you help us understand the meaning of fear in this context? Fear is the emotion uh, which results inevitably from a lack of love. Love is to fear what light is to darkness. So when there is light, there cannot be uh, darkness. And where there is love, there cannot be fear. And love entails the realization that there's really no place where you stop and I start. In a very real sense, there's one of us here. The golden rules should therefore govern our behavior because I realize that what I do to you, I'm doing to myself. When I am taught by the thinking of the world, the false belief that because on a material plane, you're over there, I'm over here. And therefore, I experience myself simply as an atomized separate creature in a random universe. I will inevitably feel fear. And out of that fractured sense of my own powerlessness and my own littleness, I will behave in insane ways. And that's really the point here. The collective uh, behavioral patterns of the human race are increasingly maladaptive for our survival on this planet. The way we treat ourselves, the way we treat each other, the way we treat animals, the way we treat the planet itself. Um, humanity is on a collision course with itself. And we must move from a strictly competitive to a collaborative way of being on the planet. We absolutely must move to a more reverential and devotional attitude towards the earth itself, towards, towards other sentient beings. Or there is a very real possibility uh, that the species will go extinct. You, just as with any other species, you will either evolve, you will adapt, you will mutate, or you will go extinct. And I think that for the first time in human history, well, it's probably not the first time in human history because there were, there have been various times when people were saying, oh, it's the end of the world, it's the end of the world. But this is the first time where it's a kind of a legitimate question uh, between nuclear bombs, climate change, uh, biochemical uh, viruses made in a lab, 
even if COVID was or wasn't, even if it wasn't, it has brought to the fore the issue of somebody is doing it somewhere. There are so many ways that we on the Titanic could hit the iceberg. And at this point, we must turn around. And the only way to turn around is to interrupt the fear-based thinking that dominates the world. And that fear-based thinking is predicated on the idea that I'm separate from you, that what I do to you won't come back at me, that I don't have to worry about you. I only have to worry about myself. That is the core false belief that has led us uh, to the brink of disaster and which must be transformed in order for us to repair. By giving more attention to the wisdom of the heart, as you say. Now, I'm wondering about, I saw an, a, an interview where you talked about how desensitized people have come. You were talking about America specifically, but it's not something that's just happening in America. This desensitization of people because of what's thrown at us through media every day, the violence. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons. I'm wondering if you can speak to this issue a little, a little bit and, and how people can actually cultivate a sense of resensitization towards what's going on. We have this um, happy, happy, happy delusion, this yellow smiley face, happy, happy. This idea that if I'm not happy, there's something psychologically wrong with me. I think sometimes the fact that we're depressed is a sign of a functional uh, mental health system, not a dysfunctional one. If you are dwelling in the world that has as much unnecessary suffering as ours does today, especially if you are a privileged person living in one of the richest countries, which both you and I are, uh, and facing how much our countries at least indirectly contribute to that suffering, if not by what we do, then by what we don't do, and you're not depressed, what is wrong with you? You know, if you have a broken leg, your brain registers pain because it's a message to reset the bone. And so much of the suffering of the modern world is a sign from our brain, reset your thinking, go a different way. You cannot feel at peace living so such a separate existence from recognition of and tending to the suffering of other sentient beings. So this idea that if I'm in pain, there's something wrong with me, so let me numb my pain, is part of the insanity of the normal world. If I'm in pain, why am I in pain? And if you look at deeply enough why I'm in pain, you realize it's not just your own pain. You're in pain because of the billions of people who are in pain and how unnecessarily they are in pain. Um, I felt with the um, American invasion of Iraq, something was very, very wrong with the American psyche that we were so easily bamboozled, so easily propagandized into this nonsense that somehow we were supposed to attack a country, drop bombs on homes of people, uh, in those houses were men and women and children. Um, these people had done nothing to us. That country had done nothing to us. And this bogus claim of weapons of mass destruction, when the United States does business with countries that have weapons of mass destruction every single day. Um, something was wrong with us that we let that happen so easily with so little, relatively little pushback. There was protest. And I'll tell you, uh, Tony Blair was the one who cut off that protest because between Tony Blair and um, what was his name, the American general who died recently, um, Colin Powell, because people were starting to say, wait, 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 what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? And then when Colin Powell signed on, which I think he regretted for the rest of his life was the sense I got, uh, Tony Blair signed on, people went, well, you know, Colin Powell and Tony Blair say, and we just went right, uh, not just to the brink of disaster uh, for the soldiers who died there and for the Iraqi people, it was total disaster. And then I must say, uh, America has a, an unfortunate habit of when we have made mistakes, um, and certainly that was a mistake, doing a little more than oops. You know, for many people my age particularly, we were screaming, this is Vietnam all over again. And we were so, you know, the voices of people saying that were so overwhelmed. 
And I felt, you know, if this country had appropriately experienced the shame and the horror of what it meant when the truth finally was said by no less than the architect, Robert McNamara of Vietnam himself, he said it was a terrible mistake. This country should have gone to sleep for three days and just screamed into pillows and hit the wall. We never processed it. We never processed the shame. We never processed the horror. We never processed the healthy shame and guilt and tried to repair it. And I think if we have, if we had been more sensitive to our own shame and to the realization of this terrible thing that we had done, then I don't think we would have so easily repeated it in Iraq or repeated the unmitigated disaster of how we carried out the mission in Afghanistan. I hear a lot of people these days, I mean, wiz, wise people talk about the lack of collective memory. Like we, we just move on to the next thing so quickly. Do you think that's part of what's going on here? Like something like Iraq and then it's just, it's done and then it's on to the next thing and we just forget about what happened? Well, look, in your country and in mine, there are people who are trying to excavate those memories. I mean, we've read, I read about your country, just as I'm sure you read about mine. Um, there have been apologies. Uh, you're obviously dealing with the memories of some of the um, indigenous peoples and the horrors of the church and the schools. And, you know, you've had your stuff as well. And yes. there are people in the United States trying to do the same thing. So much of the conversation about race in America. Um, people are demanding uh, that we face uh, deeper truths about uh, systemic race in America that has been with us since 1619. You know, there are people uh, demanding that we that we have a deeper conversation about uh, treatment of indigenous peoples in this country, et cetera. So there are people trying to excavate those memories and knowing that we must. And many people, probably with good intention, think let it just be in the past. But that's not how an individual moves forward and it's not how a nation moves forward you have to own it you have to atone for it you have to make amends and then you can go on thank you um something that's recently happened in the u.s and i heard you speak about it a bit is the overturning of roe v wade <clears throat> um, the abortion issue in the u.s and what i've heard you say about it a couple of times is that you agree that that abortion is an issue of morality, but it's not an issue of public morality. It's an issue of private morality. Can you tell us a little bit more what you mean by that? Well, exactly what you just said. I don't think, no. except in the case of sex with children, that the government has any right to tell you what to do in your bedroom or what to do with your body. And I uh, do believe, as, as you said, it is a moral issue, but I trust the moral decision-making of the American woman. Uh, the idea of a casual abortion is as much a moral anathema to me as it is to any so-called pro-choice, I mean, pro-life or anti-choice person. But the vast, 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 vast majority of abortions in this country are not casual. And I, I, a lot of these, you know, anti-choice people seem to have no idea what a woman goes through. Many women make the decision to abort a child, whether you and I were, would always agree with that or not. Um, based on what she feels are the moral imperatives of her life, whether it has to do with her economics, whether it has to do uh, with her age, and obviously the issue of, let's say, a woman who's been raped. The idea of making a woman who's been raped have an abortion, that is immoral. That is immoral. Uh, the fact that you are basically dooming thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of women to unsafe abortions um, if you... Uh, as you overturn Roe v. Wade and criminalize it the way they are in so many states. That is immoral. What is immoral is all of the suffering uh, that is now already being caused uh, for people all over this country, and particularly girls and young teenagers. This is horrible what's happening. Um, it moves the needle. Um, it moves ground zero in this, in this struggle to the states. Uh, so people are really waking up to this all of a sudden. Your state legislature matters so much. Your gubernatorial race matters so much. But that's what I meant by the issue of public morality versus private morality. This is a question which the individual must deal with. 
and the, um, the law should not be making moral decisions for the individual. The law, however, should face the fact that when its own policies cause untold suffering, that is an immoral law. That's what I think. I feel the overturning of Roe v. Wade is immoral. Thank you. Marianne, um, I was really, really excited to speak to you today for, for a particular reason. Um, you're, you're now just, you know, world famous quote uh, from a return to love, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. I used to carry that around in my wallet. For years, I, I carried it around in my wallet and I would share it with people. And it was when I was going through real a time of change in my life. And I just, it gave me so much in, inspiration and strength. So first thank of all, you. I want to thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So much. And I was so happy today that I got to share that. I do I do coaching with coaching clients and I got to share that with one of my clients today. I said, I'm so excited. And he really needed that kind of inspiration. And I shared it with him and um, he found it so moving and so oh, helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for that. And I, I'm just curious, I know this like, this is like your, your hit song that, you know, it, it stays with you for life. But I'm, I wanted to know, um, do you remember the moment when you wrote that? The space you know what? That, that paragraph is nothing separate in the book. It's embedded in a section in Return to Love on personal power. I always say, if you like the paragraph, read the book. There's so many paragraphs. There's nothing separate about it. I can't really take credit for it. I mean, the subtitle of the book is Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. That is a principle in the course that the ego mind says, no, you can't just love everybody. That, you know, that's danger. That's danger. And that's because it is the annihilation of the ego. So our default position is uh, a perverse comfort zone of no i'm over here i'm alone i'm just a small separate powerless person so that's just reflecting on what the course in miracles has to say so no i not only do i have no memory particularly of writing that paragraph although i certainly remember writing that book i have no idea to this day no one has come up and said to me you know i'm the person who took one paragraph out of that book and misattributed it to Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. Isn't that interesting? It is. Yeah. It is. I have no idea how that happened. And the, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, they have no idea how it happened. I mean, I would be honored if Nelson Mandela had quoted my words, but he didn't. It's all just an urban myth. Isn't that interesting? It is. It is. And it's funny because the way I got that little piece of paper in my wallet was it was, I had to memorize it for an audition for a presentation team in university. And it was attributed to Nelson Mandela on that piece of paper. And it wasn't until I did a bit of research online that I found it was from your book. Yeah, I, I read an article, you know, my book came out in 1992. Nelson Mandela was inaugurated in 1994. And I read his speech, he did not quote me and his office said he never did. Um, I read one article where somebody was talking about Miriam Williamson says that was her words. That woman will stop at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Another person said to me, prove it. I said, copyright law? You know, people who, one of the things I've definitely learned in my career, people who don't want to like you, won't like you no matter what. Hmm. Well, you certainly, I'm sure, learned some lessons about having a thick skin because you've really put yourself into the fire with uh, going into politics. And I, and I really admire that. Thank you. Well, more than I knew, I probably wouldn't have done it if I had realized the extent of the uh, brutality that awaited me. But uh, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Marianne, if we're getting towards our time, but I, I wanted to ask you, it seems I've, I've kind of picked up on something from some of your other interviews that it seems your father has really been a source of inspiration for you oh, he was. over the years. Yeah. And in particular, uh, I loved what you said. You said that he told you to, he was a lawyer and he said mm -hmm. to you to speak to the smartest person in the jury. That is so true. That has informed my entire career, speaking to audiences. And one of the things that has so frustrated me about politics is that politicians in America today talk to people like they're 12 years old. I mean, it's almost like 
they're, they have moved into a formula where they think we need to talk to people like they're stupid. Well, the problem is we're living at a very serious time on the planet. And if ever there was a time for all of us to be adults, it's right now. The, 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 our political system has contributed to the infantilization of the modern American mind. And I don't know how it is in Canada. I know in Europe, I find the just general conversation around the dinner table about politics so much more intelligent and so much more sophisticated. It's not that Europeans are more intelligent than Americans. It's just that American, the media holds a more intelligent conversation. Pop, the, the conversation among politicians is more intelligent. Um, but when you do speak to people like mature adults, an amazing thing happens. They awaken to the mature adult inside themselves. And I found that even when I ran for president, if you got down and got real with people, they'll get down and get real with you. And yes, that came from my father saying, always speak to the smartest person on the jury. We, we have too many forces out to create money and power for themselves by speaking to the lowest common denominator in America. And look where that has gotten us. And if you speak to the highest common denominator in people, you're really speaking to the God in all of us. People are smart, people are noble, people are dignified, people are mature if they are given the opportunity. And um, we need a politics of that. So Marianne, I know you have this, this speaking tour coming up in Canada um, starting on August 21st. What else are you working on? Is there any upcoming projects you want people to know about? Yes, I'm doing a, um, an online seminar on September 9th and 10th called Aging Consciously. Uh, that wouldn't be for you, but it's for <laughs> people who are dealing with the conscious creation of a glorious chapter three. I will be doing a six-week coaching course after that. Those things can be, uh, people can find out about those on marianne.com. And also I write on a substack. So marianneweaveson.substack.com. So I'm, I'm out there. I'm all over the place if people are interested. And I encourage everybody to check out Marianne's work. It's, it's wonderful, continues to be as or more inspiring than it ever has been. And I'm, I'm so grateful for everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if it's appropriate. I wanted to ask if you would either share or I could share that famous quote. I just, I think it's so timeless. Um, well, I as have a to closing. tell you something. I'm one of the few people I know that don't have it memorized, but I can try. Um, sure. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be talented, gorgeous, fabulous, um, I think brilliance. Uh, in fact, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You were meant to shine as children do. Um, as you, I think there's one line there before, as you are liberated. What is it? You probably have it as in front of you. I do. I do. We were born to make manifest. We were born to make manifest the glory of God, right? And then as we are liberated from our, well, you finish it. Because yeah. It's it. not just in some of us. It's in everyone. Yeah. yeah. And as we um, let our own light shine, we subconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear. Others are automatically liberated around us. Is that the line? Yes. Good. Right. <laughs> you, together we made it through. <laughs> together. We through. Well, that's a real thrill for me to do that with you, Marianne. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so today. much. God bless you. I hope I meet you. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. 
Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.